Me okay? Yeah, absolutely. Good. Uh, well, I'm glad to tell you we're getting a crowd gathering online, and there's about an equal crowd gathering in the, the lecture hall today. So this is good. The coffee has worked, as have the sport uh, activities. So I'll give you the quick introduction, and then we'll be happy to hear what you have to say to us. So uh, to the audience here and those watching online, uh, welcome to the first plenary session on the last day of the conference. Thank you and congratulations for bringing yourselves uh, into the hall today. Uh, this morning, we're going to hear uh, Jocelyn Ward speaking, uh, Jocelyn Wybird, sorry, the director of the Language Center at the University of Cambridge, and Mark Critchley, the director at the Center for Foreign Languages Study. Uh, as they're talking, we'll have the opportunity for questions. Uh, we have the microphone, so I'll be able to pass it over to you. I'll also keep an eye on the, the live stream chat, and I will let you know if there are any questions coming from there. So, uh, I would like to hand over to Mark and Jocelyn. Uh, when you're ready, off you go. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Bruno. And um, we're very sorry that we can't be with you. Uh, we would have loved to be in Bruno. And thank you, everybody at the organizing committee, for putting on such an amazing conference in such interesting times. Um, as uh, Chris said, um, I'm Jocelyn Weibert from Cambridge. Uh, Mark Critchley, I'll just get you to introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm talking to you today in my capacity fundamentally as chair or president, as you may refer to it, of the Association of University Language Centres in the UK and the Republic of Ireland. So we've decided to look at um, internationalisation strategies and how language policies actually fit into those and the role of language centres in um, uh, helping our universities to develop their internationalisation strategies to include language policies. Um, we will be talking partly, for, of course, from our own experience of UK universities, but what we believe is that many of the points we will make have resonance for you in other universities uh, around, uh, uh, across the, the whole region and in other circular members. Um, from our point of view, looking at British universities, we would say that internationalisation strategies, so these are the strategies at university level, um, have traditionally evolved along the following lines. They focus primarily to date on recruitment of students from outside the United Kingdom. And I'm sure that for many of your universities as well, recruitment of international students is a key plank of internationalization strategies. The other key plank is the development of international research partnerships um, and potentially some international partnerships for education purposes. So that could include memorandum of understanding between universities, partnerships in joint research projects, international research centers. Many British universities have also opened overseas campuses. I can think of a couple who have campuses in uh, China, but also in many other uh, parts of the world as part of their international and uh, internationalization strategies. And some have transnational education programs uh, and that may be so for some of your universities as well. And of course, overseas recruitment offices are a key plank because they are part of spreading that university's brand internationally and, of course, of uh, uh, trying to bring in international students. Um, the drivers for internationalization, um, in our experience, are partly reputation and brand. So getting the university's name out there internationally, having it respected uh, for its excellence in research, for example, but also as a brand um, for education purposes to attract international students. A lot of universities will now talk about how they are a global university and produce global graduates. We'd like to unpack a little bit of that in our talk as to what we think we mean by a global university or what our universities mean and what we in language centres may think that means. And of course, a major driver for universities is the financial returns that come from overseas recruitment, the ability to charge higher student fees uh, than are, uh, are charged for home students uh, by bringing them in internationally. And that helps to fund the educational and, of course, research agendas. We're also going to look in this talk at um, where some of the circular conference themes um, interplay with this theme of internationalization and um, looking at uh, language policies um, as well. 
So clearly, plurilingualism for both academic and professional purposes is a key uh, conference theme and uh, fits into this very well. And yet, for many of us, we may find that our university's internationalization strategies barely mention language at all. And this is one of the points that we want to make. Or if they do mention language, it is actually focused only on English for academic purposes, uh, English for English medium instruction, but doesn't go beyond that. And we'd like to make the case that internationalization strategies should actually require a focus on plurilingualism as well. Policy and policy implementation, well, that is key to what we're talking about and our roles as well. And of course, we will refer a bit to the COVID-19 context, but that isn't our main focus. Um, we thought uh, we would remind you of a Volco um, memorandum on politics um, in 2018, and this particular quote, language centers do not exist in isolation from the rest of the higher education institution, though I have to admit sometimes for many of us it feels as if we do, um, and we're seen as an add-on rather than as core. Um, but continuing, and the latter in turn, the higher education institutions, cannot isolate itself from political and sociocultural developments, whether on national and international level. Well, I think we've all seen that particularly strongly this year with the unprecedented international crisis that is going on. The universities can't isolate themselves from that, but we need to be part of the core solutions for universities. And that is something that we will be arguing with a challenge to all of you by the end of this talk. So, the challenge that we are setting, um, you and ourselves, how can language centre programmes influence a broadening of the concept of internationalisation beyond the drivers that I've already mentioned? What role can we play in initiatives to internationalise the university as a space of study and work and in terms of its reputation as a global university producing global graduates? Looking at the role of language centres then, we are, uh, can't separate ourselves from, uh, from our own universities, but what, what is the space that we occupy? Now, in UK universities, most of this is the case, but I think we believe that from our knowledge of, of all of you and so on, that this is actually probably pretty similar in most uh, language centres in most universities across the circular membership. We're often regarded as a service department, not even as a core academic department. That may differ, but frequently we're regarded as a service department. And if we're a service department, we're there to serve the university's aims, but we're not often brought in strategically to help to develop the university. We'd like to change that, but actually even as a service department, we have a role to play in bringing our expertise to play in the development of university strategies. Clearly, delivery of English to uh, inter academic English to international students or for English medium instruction is a key plank of many of us. In the UK, in fact, not all language centres do the EAP work. That is sometimes split into different centres. But I think for many of you outside of the, uh, the Anglosphere, um, that will be a key element of what you're there to do. So somebody else recruits the students, we provide the English. Delivery of national languages for academic purposes. Now, in our context, that actually mainly means English, but it might mean Irish, for example, it might mean Scots Gaelic, it might mean Welsh, um, and so on and so on in different uh, contexts. But for many of you in Bruno, that me may mean delivery of Czech for international students. You've got Chinese students coming in, but you want them to learn Czech, both for academic purposes, but also for social integration. So that's another element. Then we've got the study of languages other than English. And for many of us, and I think that's true outside of the UK as much as it is in the, in the UK, this is often an elective, it's an extra. It's not necessarily as embedded as we would like it to be. Plurilingualism requires a focus beyond English on the study of other languages. Most of us offer programs in a wide variety of languages, but the question is the extent to which that is embedded in the culture of a university that believes in plurilingualism. That is a real challenge for all of us. Um, but as I say, mostly we don't have an established strategic role in the context of universities' concept of internationalization. We want to change that. 
The opportunities that Mark and I have identified in conjunction with other ALK members are as follows for us. And each of these seven, we will then talk about individually in a moment. So this is really our main program. Uh, encouragement and facilitation of plurilingualism for global citizenship. I've already mentioned why I think that's important. We will come on to that. Developing language skills to support research. If research is one of the major planks of internationalization, research partnerships, international research, sometimes language, quite often, the concept of language skills being required as part of such research is often ignored. We need to put that back on the table. Developing intercultural competence and awareness for staff and students. We are increasingly multilingual, multicultural campuses, and yet, the explicit development of intercultural competence is often left on one side and it is hoped that that happens by chance. We need to be putting that back on the table and on the agenda. Internationalizing the curriculum itself, variety of curricula within universities. What does internationalizing that curriculum mean? What role can we play? Supporting student mobility. This is a key plank of internationalization strategies and yet um, uh, um, we have an obvious role to play, but we could be doing more. Developing the university's global culture, we will address that one as well. And finally, the really important part is how we support the development of institutional language uh, policies, because we believe internationalization strategies need to be accompanied by ILPs. They frequently aren't. We know that some of you have talked about this over the conference. Uh, and there will be a lot that we can share with each other about how to do that, but we will come on to that in a moment. Um, I will now hang on, hand over to Mark. Thank you, Justin. Um, as Justin mentioned, we're going to walk you through each of these points now in terms of how we think universities should be engaging with their language centres in the development of each of these um, thematic areas of uh, internationalisation strategy. Global citizenship to start with <clears throat> is an increasingly common concept to be referred to um, by universities and certainly in the UK experience without really understanding exactly what we mean by that. So we throw around terms such as a global university, that our students are going to be turned into global graduates, that we're trying to develop global citizens. Um, but how we actually go about that strategically at the institutional level is never particularly very clear. Now, there are some good examples of where it does work reasonably well, but then also some other examples of where it works less well, if at all. Um, there is no real strategy in, um, certainly in my own university, for example, about how we strategically develop the attributes within our own students and what we're trying to do with them in moving them towards um, global citizenship. We make some assumptions about global citizenship in terms of how we take advantage is maybe one way of describing it, of our multinational student and staff base. So for example, we have a, a global citizenship program in Durham University, which is largely populated by international staff and students. But the engagement with home staff and students is much less prevalent. There's also an assumption that um, global graduates can be produced using outward mobility programs and um, exchange programs. These often um, are focused on the academic discipline, but very rarely in the UK context, at least, address uh, language and intercultural uh, questions. The, in the UK, again, using that as an example, um, the concept of global citizenship and developing global graduates is also covered in attempts to internationalise the curricula. Now, internationalising the curricula is a very interesting concept, which is largely focused on things like the strategic development goals and um, programmes at, uh, at the level of uh, organisations such as the United Nations. But again, they tend to address what well, can be referred to as global challenges, and we'll come on to this in the research section as well, um, but not really a link into some of the skills that the students might need or might even acquire in conducting such work. So all in all, the language and intercultural communication skills of global citizenship tend to be considered as secondary matters, if they're considered at all. And this is especially uh, an issue in the Anglophone context, where of course we have um, 
the dominance of Eng English as a lingua franca. Now, there are a lot of misperceptions about English as a global lingua franca in terms of how effective it is. And that's, um, you know, it's come up on several occasions in talks during this conference in Brno this week about um, the influence that uh, assuming English as a global lingua franca has on our approaches to teaching language and approaches to teaching other subjects as well. But of course, there isn't only one lingua franca. English tends to be dominant, but there are many other important languages as well. And we need to consider how those are all played out in the context of global citizenship. Many universities then have global citizenship programs, and I don't know, and this is maybe something we can discuss at the end of the talk, about how many of your own universities have global citizenship programs that do involve language centres. Using an example from my own university in Durham, we are part of a Matariki network of universities. It's only a small network. There are seven universities involved. Um, Durham are in there, including Uppsala, Tübingen, and, and various other universities from Canada, Australia, and North America. And the purpose, stated purpose of this global citizenship program is to face up to complex societal and global challenges, to meet and address emerging questions of the 21st century, and to use a variety of multi-institutional activities in education, research, and engagement. However, there is no language and intercultural element in this program at all, even though it's a stated global citizenship program. And the program is more about understanding the complex global challenges using international teams and international en engagement and perspectives from different parts of the globe, but doesn't focus at all really on the ability of these teams to function effectively and any of the soft skills that are required by the students in particular, particularly research students who are engaged in these programs. Now, when we then look at what global leaders, global companies are looking for from global graduates, there are a number of soft skills that are ranked in there. Now, this is um, these next two slides come from a report that's uh, called Global Graduates into Global Leaders, which was published back in 2011, nearly 10 years ago now, but it's still very relevant. And basically, employers are looking for an ability for um, individuals to work collaboratively with teams of people from a range of backgrounds and countries using good communication skills in both speaking and listening and an implication of course that those will be in more than one language. Um, individuals, global leaders in particular, people who aspire to be global leaders need to have a high degree of drive, lots of resilience, an ability to embrace multiple perspectives, to, to challenge thinking and come up with new ideas and new approaches to things. They need to have the capacity to develop new skills and behaviours. They need to have a high degree of self-awareness, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things also chime very well with reports such as the Erasmus Impact Study from 2014. And these are all uh, aligned very well with the core competencies that are believed to be developed in students by programmes such as Erasmus+. Plus. But going on, um, employers are also looking for people who can uh, work and form uh, professional global networks, international networks, networks of the sort that we are together jointly in circles. Um, global leaders need to have an openness and a respect for a range of perspectives from around the world. They need to have multicultural learning agility, multilingualism, knowledge of areas outside their own countries, an understanding of where they sit and where their organisations sit within the global context and a willingness to play an active role in society, not only locally in their own organizations, in their own communities, but also nationally and internationally. And these particular soft skills are of course, the very things that we are trying to engender within our own students in the context of um, language center programs for students in any academic disciplines. So whilst addressing global challenges from the perspective of the academic discipline is important, it's these very soft skills, actually, that are more important, particularly for employers. Now, I know there's a lot of talk about how relevant employability should be in the context of academic programmes, and maybe we, we put too much emphasis on employability. But at the end of the day, in the current world we're living in, and the environment in which language centres are trying to operate today, this is a particularly important issue. And this is where we can directly contribute as language centres to improving the outcomes and uh, outputs from global citizenship programmes. Now, just to touch on briefly Global English again. Now, 
Um, I was in one of the sessions, I think it was on Thursday afternoon, where um, a colleague from IBM was contributing to a panel. And one of the interesting things he was saying is um, it's important from an IBM perspective that graduates have three languages. It's both their home language, English, and a third international language. And that drives home the point that whilst English is important, it's not only English that's important. Now, global English, um, as we refer to it in the UK now, so this is English as it's spoken around the world, um, has become the lingua franca of international academia. Many universities, including your own, will be teaching in English, um, even if you're outside the, an anglophone country. Um, and we tend to prioritise the skills in English especially. But only English can be limiting. Um, the global challenges that we referred to earlier are largely outside the Anglosphere, Anglosphere and we need other languages and intercultural skills to be able to address those. The global economy, of course, clearly spans more than the Anglosphere. You just have to look at the current negotiations on Brexit between UK and EU to see how that's working. And of course, um, there is the communicative effect effectiveness of um, native English speakers when we're speaking to um, colleagues in international business and international relations um, environments, where it's not only the language itself, but the intercultural skills that come into play so importantly, because whilst you can maybe, maybe have to have conversations with people in English, there are still lots of opportunities for misunderstandings. And that's where the intercultural element also comes into play importantly. Now, um, we'll touch on this again um, shortly, but I just wanted to uh, share this quote with you as well from um, a document that was published by the League of European Research Universities. Now, um, LERU is a, an organisation, I think, with 19 members. Cambridge are a member, along with universities such as Helsinki, Leuven, Zurich, several circle members. Um, but it is a key interest of universities to form rounded student personalities and to graduate future mediators, forgive me a minute, I'm just going to hide my screen, um, between cultures in a globalised world. For this purpose, each additional language that they speak or at least understand will be an asset. And that's key in the perspective of language centres promoting, yes, English, but also all of the other languages that we teach as well. So I'll now hand back to Jocelyn. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so Mark has mentioned global challenges, which are often uh, research topics, which at the moment, of course, are dominated by looking for treatments and vaccines for COVID. But of course, global challenges go way beyond that. Climate change, poverty, a whole range, if you look at the United Nations list. And global challenges are something that exercise researchers. And as Mark said, not all global challenges are in the Anglosphere and therefore for research purposes, while English may be the lingua franca, global English, as Mark has just said, is the, the lingua franca of research increasingly, there are issues. So let's first look at that, uh, the issue of English. Um, language is a construction or expression of knowledge and identities. Where you have multiple identities in the same room, everybody using English actually limits very much the, um, the expression that they have of their identities. If we fail to take into account the plurilingual nature of research teams, what we do is limit the research being undertaken in its construct and its dissemination. And I think we need to bear this in mind. These are actually not my words. They are the words of Manuel Celio Concesal, who was president of ELC, CEL, who spoke at SACLA four years ago. Um, Use of a single language will fail to maintain equity amongst students and staff and could stifle creativity. Research must be multilingual and a multicultural endeavour. And I think we actually need to remind ourselves of this and we need to remind our universities of this when they're focusing, well, we don't need any other languages, we'll all just do it in English. There is actually a serious limiting factor and there's a lot of research going on about how knowledge is constructed in different cultural norms and if English is the language not only of dissemination of research, but is the language within which knowledge is being constructed and research is being conducted, then it is extremely limiting to the various perspectives that come from international research teams. We need to be quite resistant to this. Um, Mark and I are saying this as native English speakers from the Anglosphere. What we believe is that researchers should have the following. They need the necessary skills to perform in a multilingual and multicultural research team. That may be primarily 
uh, intercultural communication skills. They, they can't necessarily have all the languages of the members of their team. However, this is actually really important. And these are the soft skills that often get overlooked, as Mark has just said, by networks looking at international uh, research partnerships and so on. That means an inclusion of languages other than English. Language skills are also vital to access research sources in languages other than English. If you are researching uh, community health care in Sri Lanka or um, um, drought and its effect on, on, on crops in African countries in order to try and come up with solutions to these, if you only have access to texts, oral and uh, written texts, which are written in English, do not lose and miss out on a lot of what is going on, a lot of the policy context, etc., etc. Language skills are actually vital to access research sources. In fact, at the University of Cambridge, where we have uh, slightly more postgraduates than we have undergraduates, the Language Centre's role in supporting our researchers to gain language skills for research purposes is actually an extremely prominent one. Um, more than 50% of the students coming to our language courses and using our language centre in autonomous mode to learn other languages are actually postgraduates needing the language for research purposes, um, whether it's directly um, to access texts, whether it is for field work internationally, um, or whether it is for international research collaborations, uh, conferences in different countries and so on. This is actually really vital and us putting a plank onto the research side of it, which is often the main focus of many universities' internationalization strategies and showing the role that we have in international research is actually really important. And the other point is English may be dominating at the moment, but there is no guarantee that that is going to be so in the future. We've seen uh, different geopolitical, sociopolitical movements at various stages. Let us actually not put all our eggs in the English basket. Um, I've mentioned its impact on research output if it is limiting the approaches to research, the cultural constructs of ideas and argumentation. Um, and it really does only encourage a very specific way of looking at the world, which one could even accuse of having a post-colonial and a hangover from the colonial time if English is dominating the approach that is used by researchers to look at global challenges. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to pick up um, now on the intercultural competence and intercultural awareness for staff and students. And for us in the UK especially, um, this, this is important in the context of uh, how language, center, uh, language centers are perceived. Often, not in every case, but often language centers are perceived as being just places where you can go and learn a language. We are just teaching language. And of course we're not, we want to do and have the ability to do so much more than that. And one of the key things that we're um, starting to uh, develop more and more in the in UK language centres is uh, intercultural competence training and intercultural awareness training, not only for students, but also for staff as well. Um, so, for example, in my own university at Durham, we have 27% um, of our students are currently from outside the UK uh, at the present time. Um, we need to be able to uh, engage with that student body in much more of a way than just um, helping them uh, learn about um, UK culture. We also need to be able to draw advantages from them sharing their own experiences with us whilst they're at our own universities. Um, so the, um, we need to be able to work out how we can value these benefits of, of the multinational and diverse student body. We need to be able to support their integration we need to be able to look after their welfare and we need to manage their academic expectations. And of course, their academic expectations are quite different to uh, home students. So just taking the example of languages, um, most British students will still be very keen to learn European languages, most of them, not all of them. Most Chinese students, however, want to learn Japanese and Korean. So we end up with a, a very diverse split um, profile in terms of our language portfolio. 
We tend also to think of international students in an Anglophone context, especially that, of course, what they want to do is learn English and they want to focus on their academic English. So we tend to treat them immediately as turning up with a deficit and um, that they need to improve their English and they need to spend all of their time improving their English whilst ignoring potentially their desires to learn other languages as well. And we don't celebrate or capitalize what they can also bring in terms of the cultural and linguistic diversity. So for example, I was actually inspired by a, a talk from a colleague at Helsinki um, at the Circles Conference in Calabria, where she was describing the use of Erasmus students in the classroom as language assistants. And we're starting to do that a lot more where we can make, um, make use. I, I hesitate because it, some people might say take advantage, but certainly allow um, students to, to celebrate their own languages and their own cultures in our language classrooms and, uh, and bringing that into the classroom to help our home students. And that gives us explicit opportunities for the home students to learn more about the worldviews of the, their international student um, comrades is one way of describing them. Because it, certainly in the UK, we do tend to see polarization between um, home students and international students and the Chinese students only mixing amongst themselves, for example. I mean, we need to get more integration going on there. And that can only be improved by better intercultural communication skills. And when it comes to the workforce, the staff, so again, in Durham University, and this will be the same across many universities in Europe, we've got a very internationally diverse workforce. We've got more than 30% of the workforce at Durham are not from the UK. Um, they immediately, of course, those colleagues bring an international outlook and the value of their international experience so much more than, um, than potentially a, a home staff member can do. And it gives a challenge to, um, the universities to how we use this opportunity to expand the global mindset. One of the things and I think Jocelyn may touch on it um, shortly later on is a, a, a big issue in the UK at the moment is about decolonizing the curriculum and decolonizing the curriculum and decolonizing the university can mean looking at a wider range of views uh, at one level and taking advantage of the international opportunities presented by our international staff is one thing in there. And we need to make sure that those who would teach and support those international colleagues and also our international students are also getting intercultural uh, awareness training so that they can appreciate more some of the different challenges that are faced by some of our international colleagues. Um, so as Mark mentioned, um, I'm gonna just look at internationalizing teaching in the curriculum. If universities are producing global graduates, they should have actually um, been exposed to a global and international curriculum. Certainly in British universities, traditionally, if I take the example of studying English and English literature, the, pro the, 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 the prime focus has been, well, you can't do an English literature degree without doing Shakespeare and Chaucer and um, there's often a comment made that if you actually study English literature in a British university, you only study dead white men. Um, and diversification is actually something that is being called for a lot. But I think this is actually broader than just a political agenda, which I'll come on to in a moment about decolonizing the, uh, the curriculum. This is actually about giving our students access through regardless of their curriculum, whether it is economics, whether it's politics, whether it's history, whatever they are studying at university, having access to uh, the understanding of the research and the knowledge that has actually been developed and is being developed worldwide to data that comes from worldwide, not to the narrow curriculum that many universities may traditionally have focused on. So how do we internationalize the curriculum and the learning experience for students? Outward mobility we've mentioned, but is often the one that is regarded as we'll send them away. That's how they'll get their international experience. It's not our responsibility here on our home campus to provide that global outlook uh, within what we actually teach. We could, as Mark has already mentioned, maximize on the presence of international students in home universities in seminars to actually discuss perspectives on the same topic that come from different cultures and backgrounds. Um, maximizing on the taught input from international staff. We've recruited international staff. Is it so that they actually bring a perspective from their own culture, from their own studies, or are they then here to teach our canon? And I think this is actually something which is of interest to the faculties rather than to language centers, but how can we help to start to engage in these questions and set challenges for our colleagues? 
Our own language classes already bring together multiple nationalities and mother tongues. We are actively actually seeking uh, to give students an international uh, uh, experience, a global uh, taste within their own uh, language, uh, within their own um, uh, studies at the university. We are actually doing that, but sometimes we're the only pocket that is unless they go abroad in an outward mobility. So the decolonizing, some of you may not be familiar with this term, some of you may be more familiar with it. This is actually a movement that has been started by students primarily campaigning to decolonize taught content of curricula, to get away from the dead white men and to actually include uh, living black women, for example. This actually fits very closely into the Black Lives Matter movement that is uh, going on at the moment, where there is a, a belief uh, and a campaign to start challenging the fact that history has taught more about the role, for example, of the UK in abolishing slavery than it has about the role of the UK in actually facilitating the slave trade. But decolonizing taught content of curricula is actually can go beyond that. Internationalizing the content of curricula can go beyond that to actually having perspectives on history, perspectives of in literatures, uh, perspectives from a variety of different societies in social studies, in the social sciences, in anthropology, even in economics, looking at different economic models, not just the history of economic models in Western capitalist countries and so on and so on. This is a movement that is already happening, as I say, partly driven by the decolonization movement and the Black Lives Matter um, side of things, but it is actually broader than that. And this is actually vital. If we are producing global citizens of the future, they shouldn't just have a narrow perspective on their studies from the traditional canon of their host university in that country. And this is actually a movement that we need to be engaging with. Sure, we may not have any power over what faculties are, te uh, are teaching, but we need to be aware that this actually matters. And that if we are at the right tables in the focus groups, in the strategic discussions in universities, we need to be challenging some of these ideas. And many of these ideas clearly require language skills to mediate access to that other form of knowledge. But, of course, the challenge, as Mark has said, is that um, a part of an internationalized curriculum would be actually to ensure that students come out with intercultural competence. This is left mostly to chance at the moment, I would say, in most universities. We've got international students, they will become interculturally competent just because they're in contact with each other. But perhaps this could actually be drawn more explicitly into the teaching of other disciplines or something where language centers who have so much expertise in this area could be drawn in to helping universities to make explicit uh, the teaching of intercultural competence and communicative skills. All of this is about how we make teaching maximally inclusive. And I think the final area we need to think about here is how international staff are teaching, how international students are learning. Do they have access to the same? It's not just a question of language. They have access to the same frames of reference. How are we actually making sure that they are not disadvantaged by the content and the style of our curricula at the moment? Supporting outward mobility is, of course, uh, a key plank to internationalizing the curriculum, but also to uh, uh, an, any internationalization strategy. Unfortunately, I would argue that it has frequently be seen as the only plank in terms of students. Let them go abroad, they will get their, um, their, their um, experience there that they aren't going to get back home. At home, we will do our home thing, and while they're abroad, they get that other useful stuff uh, interculturally um, and that, that global experience. But I think um, that there are real challenges for this, particularly in the UK. We have very, very low take up, for example, of Erasmus. And unfortunately, it looks like we're actually not going to even be in Erasmus uh, quite shortly. And we don't know what will replace it. This is actually a particular worry and challenge for us in the UK. 
Um, but how do we encourage more outward mobility? Because it is undoubtedly extremely important plank of developing global citizens of internationalization of the student experience. Well, we need to make language learning more accessible. I mentioned earlier, sometimes it's just elective courses. Sometimes students have to pay for a course because they can't do it for credit within their own courses. Sometimes students can do it for credit, sometimes not, depending on the program of study. It isn't necessarily very equitable how accessible language learning and language centers is. As we've already mentioned, we could actually do more to develop multicultural understanding and communication uh, more proactively. There are already often workshops run by universities to promote and prepare students for mobility. Could language centers be doing more to support that? For example, by bringing international students and home students together to actually uh, exchange views to understand and motivate the benefits of mobility and to understand more about each other's cultures and the potential destinations that there are. And of course, all of this in turn could help to drive up greater take up of language courses if we have the resources then to be able to respond and deliver them. But I think we could play a much larger key role with face-to-face -face and online activities that are focused on mobility than we do currently. If our current role is just as the service department where the student goes to to get language uh, courses, to have the language skills from mobility, and that's all we are. That isn't sufficient. We need to be at the heart of university internationalization strategies that, that focus around mobility. We need to be seen as a key player that can help to uh, take that forward within our own universities. Um, and I think students do expect our universities to foster this opportunity more proactively. The uh, Global Graduates into Global Leaders report um, that, that Mark cited earlier has this very interesting quote from an employer. I think we're starting to see in a particular generation where they think of themselves as quite literally world citizens. Sorry about the English there, this is a direct quote. I don't mean conceptually, I mean they see the world as boundaryless, that they are able to move, shift, work anywhere and do anything. They may be able to do that. Well, not at the moment. Nobody can move anywhere, uh, particularly, but in, in, in theory. Um, but they want to see the world as boundaryless. That is the next generation. Um, how are we helping as universities to prepare them for that world where they are global graduates, global citizens? How are we giving them the skills to do that? What role can language centers play in that? Um, we have to look at COVID because this is part of it. We see that um, with everything that we've learned recently about um, uh, how to operate in a virtual world, um, there is a lot more opportunity to build on virtual exchange, e-tandem, virtual and remote learning, which can break down uh, national and linguistic boundaries, as we've already discovered from our experiences since uh, the COVID crisis struck. But why should that stop? once hopefully we go back to normal. Um, surely we can actually make more of this, that it isn't just about actual physical mobility, that it's about bringing in these different experiences at different stages and providing more flexible access through online learning to language centre courses. For staff, there are exchanges, uh, virtual workshops that could be done online um, uh, as we have discovered already, as we are discovering through this conference ourselves, um, and more flexible working potentially across national boundaries, um, which could actually help to internationalize our staff base and our campuses further, but in virtual means. The global challenges are global. Uh, the virtual cooperation can take place globally, whether it's on developing vaccines and social policy. I think that is something that we have seen uh, recently. Uh, there should be more global cooperation. Quite often, I think we feel that there are, there are individual national responses to the current crisis. But I think there are opportunities to come out from this to have a look at uh, what COVID can give us in terms of uh, a virtual international student body as well. And I, I think these are still new ideas, but the opportunities coming out of the current crisis are something to be looked at in this sphere as well. 
Okay, and um, we're going to start wrapping up towards the uh, the end of the talk now. <laughs> Basically, um, coming back to where this first started in internationalization strategies and universities. So institutions are having their research strategies, but in order for language centers to take advantage of these many things that we've been describing that A, need to be done, and B, that we could and should have a role in, it does need to be an element of a culture change uh, across university um, senior management teams in terms of how they engage with language centers and how language centers can contribute more to these um, evolving, should we say, global strategies. Now, traditionally, language centres have, have tended to be physical spaces. You know, the very word centre suggests a, a physical space of some description, usually multilingual, multicultural, especially outside the Anglosphere within the university. Now, today, um, particularly in light of COVID, but also predating COVID, language centres are um, becoming more virtual spaces. Uh, students are learning in slightly different ways. The traditional language laboratory doesn't really exist in the same way anymore. And language classes are remaining face to face, but they're also taking place remotely, you know, especially now with, with Zoom and what have you. But it's increasingly distributed to wherever students might be. And these ideas of language centers as physical spaces is changing. And that also presents opportunities in terms of um, the types of activities that we've been getting involved in. Um, we, many of us are involved in doing language cafes, conversation clubs, various intercultural events, global events taking place across the university, engaging with student unions and, and various things like that. And languages are becoming increasingly diverse. So in the Anglosphere, we've, we've been talking about the dominance of English, but in, in the UK, there's also the dominance in terms of French, German and Spanish as the traditional languages that would be taught to, to British students. Increasingly, we're teaching more Japanese, Chinese, Arabic, the large global languages, but also some of the smaller languages, if I can use that term, including Polish or Thai or other um, what might be referred to as less widely taught languages. And in the European context, this would include um, regional languages, heritage languages, heritage languages, particularly in a post-colonial context in the UK, for example, which might include some of the um, Asian and African languages. And this is a sense of how language centers themselves have already been changing and are already changing over the past um, 20 years or so. We are serving not only students, we're not serving not only staff, we serve our own communities. I know lots of the universities in Germany in particular, perhaps in Greece, especially at the moment, will be supporting refugees. Um, we are teaching more intercultural communication skills. We are less language specific um, and that's helping us think about why we teach language in the first place and all of these things are creating tendrils of international activity taking place in language centers that are now starting to merge with the various strategies taking place in in universities as we've been describing i'll just pass back to jocelyn so i think what we've seen so far is that every aspect of internationalization of a university whether it's research the student body uh, through international students whether it's outward mobility actually requires language centers to play a part and what we believe is that institutional language policies ilps should be core to this and we have a major role to play and i know some of you do i'd like to refer you all to the leru briefing paper because I have never actually seen uh, another one, and there may be other studies around, which is a pan-university study or explicitly of uh, institutional language policies. And you can Google that. It was only published last November um, by the League of European Research Universities. I have to admit that when you do read it, you will find that my own university is a member, and it is quite clear that it has nothing even approaching an ILP. My challenge to myself is absolutely massive here to try and actually get that uh, um, developed within the university. The Leru paper identifies three major goals, academic English, foreign language learning for students and for academic staff and for family members, and strengthen the professional use of regional languages. Um, but I think the key part here is the it, for promoting the concept as a multicultural and multilingual hub. And these are the reasons that in Leru are cited why language learning should be promoted. Um, not only for the immediate needs and purposes of the different groups involved, 
but because it's personally enriching, it's about creating a true community. And this final quote, which I absolutely adore, for the institution as a whole, all this has the additional benefit of opening a new substantial dimension of creating or solidifying a true corporate identity. This is the argument within the Leru uh, study for multilingualism, for plurilingualism on our campuses. Um, we believe that ILP should encompass slightly more of all of this. Language requirements for international recruitment and admissions, absolutely vital. The national language or languages of the university, also very, very important and sometimes overlooked if English is taking, um, uh, has taken over completely. But the learning of other languages, as we've already seen, as part of the global graduate package to support global mobility as part of an international research strategy. This one is so often left out, but I hope we've provided an argument as to why that should be included. And to support the development of the university's global identity and culture. And it should be a key element of any international or internationalization strategy. These are our recommendations to you when you are working with your university on the development of an ILP. Okay, I'm going to wrap up. Um, basically, in the UK context, um, it, this, this whole talk, why have we been talking to you? But this whole talk originated as a briefing paper that we put to members of AULC. And, and at the end of that briefing paper was a manifesto as to how university language centres could engage better with our university internationalisation strategies. So um, just briefly in the context of uh, AULC, a global university should celebrate the international and intercultural um, uh, dimensions of all its staff and students. Language centres will foster a multilingual and multicultural culture, forgive the, the back poor English there. A global university will be committed to developing students into global graduates with education and international mobility strategies to reflect this commitment, etc. A global university's research strategy will reflect the need for language and intercultural skills. Language centres will support the development of language and intercultural skills amongst staff as well as amongst students so that we can maximise the opportunities from an international curriculum. And a global university in the UK will adopt an effective institutional language policy that, yes, prioritises English, but recognises the importance of other languages as well. Now, of course, there is um, a language policy focus group in SEC, and many of the European universities have well-established institutional language policies. In the UK, with the exception of some of the universities that also teach in the, in the context of uh, being in Wales or Scotland, where Gaelic and um, Welsh are important, very few universities, particularly in England, have anything like an institutional language policy. So our call for action for SEAC, this is the, the last couple of slides, in fact, the last slide, what we would recommend is maybe that CERC might consider um, having a, a similar manifesto that could um, look at how language centres can take advantage of all of the various things that we can do to contribute to internationalisation strategies. So you could take this could say this could take the form of a, a statement where perhaps language centres can adopt a leadership role in internationalisation activities within their own institutions. That we could foster the collaboration and the networks that we already have, but maybe to take greater advantage of some of the other um, aspects that we've been referring to in the, in the talk today. That we will commit, as we still do and always have done, um, to promote international and intercultural diversity, both within our institutions and within our local communities. That we will embed, and language centres will take a leading role in embedding a multilingual and multicultural environment in the university that we will commit to developing students into global graduates, we will support global citizenship, we will support employability and mobility. And in doing so, we will seek to take a leading role in institutional strategies that help foster and support that. And that we will challenge and support all our own universities to develop institutional language policies, not only that refer to um, the particular language of uh, the corporate body, but that extend beyond that corporate identity to all of the various things that we've been talking about today. And with that point, we obviously link in with various focus groups that SERC have. We've talked about multilingualism, we've talked about aspects of autonomy, we've talked about aspects of language policy, we have a management and leadership focus group, and maybe we can address some of these issues through SERC focus groups with a renewed vigour. Thank you very much for your time, and I will stop sharing my screen.
I hope you can hear that uh, big round of applause for you both there. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, so if we have a few minutes for questions, uh, if I throw it to the audience, uh, do any of you have any final questions for them? Okay, we'll go to the online chat and we'll see what's happening uh, in the chat box. Okay, so there are some requests about papers being available online. Uh, so Mark, there's a paper that you recently mentioned. Yes, yeah, so we, we, we are, um, we, I know the SEP conference will be looking at producing proceedings, um, but we're happy to share our slides with anyone who wants them. They can either email myself or Jocelyn direct or, or through the SEP, um, through the conference um, email address. And um, I can certainly happy, happily share the uh, original briefing paper that we produced, but we will be updating that hopefully if our paper abstract is accepted for the conference proceedings. Uh, Mark, I think I think you provided the link on the first slide I did, yeah. um, of our presentation, and it is www.aulc.org forward slash documents. You should find the um, the AULC statement on international language policies and internationalization there, uh, and that is an agreed one for the AULC as a national um, organization. Um, but really what we are challenging is that, that we should have similar kinds of manifestos, if you like, statements uh, coming out uh, across SACLA organizations, but ha perhaps one even for SACLA. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, with no more questions. Oh, sorry, we have one more question. I'll just run the microphone over. Kotarska equals. It's not a question. It just on behalf of equals in particular to thank you for the broad perspective for uh, 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 raising the issue of inclusion, plurilingualism, uh, globality, and mobility uh, in this particular context. And I think what is even more valuable is that it comes from the UK context. And I think we all appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I, I think I think we have a lot to apologize to the world for. Um, <laughs> and I think we have a lot of catching up to do because we've exported English to the rest of the world. Um, and often that has meant that the British have been on the back foot, let us say, in terms of recognizing the value of plurilingualism and diversity of perspectives. Those of us working in language centers in the UK tend to be on a come from a particular perspective at wanting to combat that. Um, but we are, you have to understand, sometimes um, swimming against uh, a dominant tide of English is enough in our own culture. Sure. Uh, we have one Maybe more. Maybe if I could just take the liberty just to close. Um, I'm, I'm aware that much of what we've talked about will be very familiar to many of you. And, and some of our language centres are more privileged than others. Um, so some of you will already be adopting some of these strategies, but, but CERC is a, an organization now with 387 members. AULC has 79 members. And what we're trying to do is to offer opportunities where all of our members can engage with these strategies and offer, offering um, some ideas for them as to how, how to move forward. And that's where maybe we could um, engage with some of the focus groups as well. And I'd also just like to say that myself and Jocelyn have presented today, but my colleagues, Neil McLean, who's the director of the Language Center at the London School of Economics, and uh, Dr. Anna Demideros, who's the director of the Language Center in King's College London, have also contributed to the paper. Sorry, thank you guys. We have one more comment. Yes, well, it was just a remark. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And I just wanted to say that as uh, the Secretary General of Circles, I have, of course, noted the suggestion to have a similar manifesto for Circles as an association representing the language centers in Europe. And this is something we will try and organize in the future with your help, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And thank you, Bruno, and enjoy the rest of the conference. It's been great and well done for the, all the organization. Yeah, thank you very much indeed.